First and foremost, I just want to say thank you for um, the warmth and welcome to be here on this land. Mm -hmm. You well, know, I, like the I feel like the moment came here and you saw you and felt that from you and then how you offered in the morning and just I feel like the f I, f I felt in the room that everyone felt like cared for and helped relax the system to feel welcomed here. So I just want to say thank you. Namakwa, Namakwa, you're welcome. And uh, just ask the cedar tree to to give me that connection to the spirit that can, you know, bring us together. And I really believe the time to come together is right now, and the importance of that that we also let go of things that separate us, that tell us that we are separate, even from each other or from that water or from the tree people or the plant people or the natural animal people or any of them that we know we know that now is that time yeah. yeah you know and being here too and you know just all the beautiful storytelling that you've been sharing i was wondering if you'd be open to sharing a little bit more about here this island and the peoples here and just a story about this place that we're at sure that would be really feel Absolutely. good and if and also if Orcus is the what's the the traditional name of this island? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm still learning my language. I wish I knew the name of this island. I can tell you the name of the village site for Friday Harbor, because my uncle has that name, and his father gave him that name. So these islands have been used by our people in a permaculturing way, an extreme permaculturing fashion, and recognizing the gifts that the Creator put on each island. And then we, as people, come and migrate here. And, and uh, But our people also lived there on Friday Harbor, and that is Stalkwith. So we lived in, in houses year-round, but we also migrated. So it's a combination of both. But that island there, in San Juan Island, that harbor, its name is Stalkwith, and that's my cousin's name because his father gave him that name. He said, I give you this name so you'll never forget, never forget where you come from, Stalkwith. One of the 27 longhouses there. My other teacher, Wistimini, tells me through his history. So, yeah, we've been here, my mom, she traveled every year here. She went to Dobe, and uh, you know they burned all our canoes down. They tried to end who we are as indigenous people. So you will not go out in that water anymore, and you will not have a relationship with those salmon. You cannot have, for us it was saying that you can't have a sacred promise to them anymore. We won't be able to keep that alive. They won't be able to do all the practices that we've always had, and and so, my grandpa, he built these boats that were not canoes, and uh, it was okay to do that. And uh, he spoke no English, but he would observe the workers on the docks, and he was able to watch and see how they did things. And he ended up making these little fishing boats, and he'd bend all the ribs for them. My mom helped doing that, and they'd steam them. My mom has stories where my grandpa was going to pick up those big pots of steam and water to put those ribs in to bend them. And, but my mom said she wanted to help in a language. She'd say, I want to help. And her father said, Awa, it's too dangerous. No. But she kept agging on him. And finally he said, okay, but you have to be really careful. And so they would put gunny sacks on the hand and carry them and carried it and then steamed the wood. And then, uh, and then my grandpa bent those ribs. And my, my mom, she had to go help. Yeah, and go stand on them too and bend them, but he put Model T engines in them. So he's able to come here, right here, to this place in Dobe, and uh, yearly. So he's one of the last ones, and my mom, 
be able to migrate here and still live from the land when the, the land and water was well enough to live from here because this place was ultra abundant in food and that's why we would migrate here and that's why we lived here. Of course, all of the Salish Sea was this way, a heartbeat ago, just like that. And uh, it all changed. But this place in particular, these islands, each one of them had a different gift that the Creator gave. And so we recognize those and would help them along if the Creator showed us a way that was all right to, to add a little bit of our medicine to them to make them even more abundant. And so, yeah, Dobe right there. My mom grew up there every summer. She'd go there. Yeah, she has fond memories and stories of that time. What was your, what's your mom's name? Sasayat that. Sasayat that. And it's Mary Wagner. Yeah, Mary Wagner. Yeah, we're Saanich First Nations people. And so these territories of our Lummi and our Hosanich and our people over in Squamalt and, and also Samish people. So, yeah, it was a great convergence place for our people. Yeah. Something that I was really loving and appreciating, so many things actually, it's just so nice to be with you. When you were sharing up on the stage is um, the, the living beings of, mm. you know, in nature and the living beings and the life force really of the creator, the living, everything's alive. And um, curious about the, the offering, how we can feed and nourish and give back to these living beings in a good way. Mm -hmm. If there's anything to share about that. Absolutely, yeah. We, we see the world in the place it is now. We see in the era that we are inside of where life has not been respected, where the era of life of our people, caring for life and, and the wellness and relationship and all of those things were intact. And we live in this era where it is virtually the opposite where the respects have not been paid, the sacredness of those things and the gratitude given to each living being, each people, has been broken because of colonialism, because of the wish for uh, dominance and power and affluence and, and, and money going to a, a tiniest percent of a very top echelon uh, laws written for mostly uh, colonial white men, you know, and that's just the truth. And, and, and so we see the effects of that. We see that our climate systems are not doing well. We see that the water is not producing that food and the rivers are not full of salmon and the ancient forests are not there anymore. And the natural animals don't have a home anymore. And it's because that sacred trust that we have held on to as indigenous people since time immemorial, we made promises to those salmon. We made promises to those trees. Those are where we come from and those are our relationship. And so we, we have always cared for them, saying that we would only take part of your family to help our family. And in those sacred words that speaks to their soul, letting them know that each family, each people will continue until the end of time. And that we'd only take part of them and we'd give them that respect, give them th those words, give them that sacredness. And, uh, and, you know, it just hasn't happened. It just hasn't happened. I haven't witnessed it uh, inside of the colonial world. I just haven't witnessed that kind of uh, sacred offering to all of these beings. And I usually tell people, I say, you know, um, in a word that my mom had learned from her mama, my mom was born in the longhouse in the Chaikaitlam. And with the earth floor is a real longhouse, you know, with the cedar planks, open fires. And, uh, and so she heard so many teachings of our elders. And that's how we, you know, have created paradise because those elders taught the children. And, and since time immemorial, elders teach children. Parents don't teach children, not in our tradition, not necessarily. The elders raise the children and now they have an unfettered path all the way to eldership because they get all of those teachings in their bones. And uh, so that teaching that my mom heard from her mama, who didn't speak any English either, and my mom didn't speak any English, 
till she was eight years old and they beat that language into her, you know. Um, it's in translation and it says, my grandma told my mom, you always raise your hands to those trees. And this is gratitude for people. This is the highest gratitude. You raise your hands. You always raise your hands to those trees. You know why? Because they breathe out what we breathe in. And, you know, I asked children, hey, what is that? What is that that you breathe in? They all got oxygen. How important is it? Really important. How really important is it? It's really super important. And then I say, how really super important it is. And I say, life or death. And yes. So you receive a gift that's life or death. How many feel that that is worth giving a gratitude back to? And they all raise their hands. And they got it right now. And I say, that is the basis of our understanding. That if you serve respect, you give an acknowledgement and a respect, then that being will respect you back and it will continue to gift you because that is a sacred agreement that we had at the beginning of time. Literally, between the the different peoples. And so when we have that kind of reverence and that kind of relationship, so build a good relationship with every single being around you. Build actively. Say words to these beings. Acknowledge. Let them know that you would not harm one family. And, uh, and I know it's difficult in this world. This world has separated us from our food. It has separated us from nature. It has separated us from our own elders and, and caused them to nearly vanish. And uh, it has drawn lines between so many things. But I'm a firm believer that if we decide something is of value, that we can return it. We can say this is important. This relationship, this knowing of who we are as human beings that at the basis of who we are are these people who have a sacred word, a sacred promise to each and every people, human and non-human, around us. And when we have that kind of promise, we have a very close relationship to them. As we give that gift to them, we leave some tobacco before we pull the cedar bark from the tree. And we utter words of sacred promise and introduce ourselves. So now we literally have a relationship as we would, as you and I have a relationship. And um, uh, it would be like going up to somebody and, and just, uh, you know, taking their hair off. Taking, you know, like if we, you just pulled part of their hair off and you didn't even acknowledge them or, or speak to them. And, uh, and, you know, that's really something that, that I believe matters, that we, we learn how to build stronger relationship with the circle of life. Because what we're working for, in my opinion, in my feelings, and my observation, is that we are working for the circle of life. We're working to restore it. We're working for it to be well. Wellness is something that is it's not here now, and we're not moving towards it as a whole in this United States of America or Canada. But a heartbeat ago, we had wellness. We had wellness, and it lived in everything. And so, how did we create it? Because we created that wellness. We created a paradise here. And, and I believe that those things that we've always held on to, our roadmap to wellness, to harmony with all life, to true peace, because the colonial world does not understand the word peace. I'm afraid to say it, but we're not in an era of peace. We're just not. And peace is when you are respecting each being, and each being has offered you up that promise that they will feed the circle of life. The salmon will feed the circle of life until the end of time. They'll feed our souls. They'll feed our beings. And, and, and now we have something. And so my goal is to allow us to, to take something that's ancient right here under our feet and, and apply it to things that we have today, which are innovations and, 
and wonderful and beautiful ideas and things that we're doing here at this convergence and then put them together and have a roadmap to the future. And that way we, we say we have a proven roadmap right here. It's ancient and it worked for our people. And why are we not educating people that way? It's because colonialism decided, the government decided that this needs to die. So something over here can live and that's called profiteering. That's called money and that's called greed. And it, it, it owns the souls and still owns the souls of many people who are our decision makers are supposed to be our leaders. And uh, so those are some of my feelings in that many things are missing. The way that I look at it, I see things that lived in our ancient world and do not live in this current colonial world, the world that our people have been placed into. And the best thing that I can do is follow my heart and, and lis listen to those elders and, 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 and bring out those words that they, they have brought to us. And, uh, and, and uh, so many teachings they, they've shared and, and I, I love each and every one of them because they're living beings. Even the teachings are alive. Even the teachings have a soul. Even they do. Everything is, is alive. And, and a moment is alive. And, and a relationship is alive. And, and, and you know, that, that, that wellness that we talk about, that, that's alive too. That victory that we're going to have over all of this insanity that colonialism has placed upon the land and the water and served detriment to all of these things. But the spirit of that victory that will overcome all of those things is alive and, and we have to feed it. We have to acknowledge it because our way of praying, the way that my elder taught me to pray, was not to ask for things. We will not just ask and say, oh, give me, please give me this, or not to grovel. We're to, to be part of the creation of it. And so we thank the Spirit for what we can see, what we can feel. And I can feel the spirit of wellness. I can feel the spirit of peace and wholeness once again. I, I know it's alive and I'm willing to feed it. I'm willing to say right here, it's here. I'm going to give it medicine. I'm going to give it water. I'm going to give it love. I'm going to give it all these things. I'm going to give it wisdom. And now that spirit of life, of wellness, it's, it will flourish. And it will flourish with the ancient knowledge and the innovation of people today. And, and that's called a prayer. So when I said once to a group of people, and an elder was there, and I, I said, I hope. I used the word hope, and an elder came up to me after, and he said, you used the word hope. I said, I know. I apologize. I said, I know we are a prayerful people because we do not hope. We pray. We create it. It's our power. Our power is from here. The most powerful thing in the world is prayer and love and our wisdom that we put here and that's going to move beyond this. It's going to move beyond this. And it's going to create that world of harmony and peace and wellness for all beings. So when I think about the things that we're doing, it's not just for the human children. It is for them very much. But it's also for the children of everything that the Creator put here. Every one of those future generations of every people, tree, plant, animal, water, the mountain, the air that we breathe, all of it. So that's, that's the best that I can explain my, my feeling about how we need to think in a holistic way. We need to do the best we can to, to listen to ancient knowledge and wisdom and, and apply it in a way that, that, that brings both worlds together. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one, one of the things that my 
elders have always shared with me is the, the importance of storytelling and the passing of the wisdom with storytelling. And um, I was wondering if there was a story, we have about 10 minutes, that would you'd be open to sharing here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have an understanding about what we call SWIM. SWIM is our teachings, it is our understanding, it is our knowing, it is our histories, and it's not the English word story. It's the best thing that we have now, possibly, that is one word. But a, the word story can be belittled. It can say, oh, you're telling stories, making it up. No, these are the things, the way we created a future. They have enormous amounts of value and strength, and they are alive. As a song is alive, it has a spirit. A story is alive, it has its own soul, it does its own work. So I'd like to share a suyem of the whale story. And uh, it's one of my favorite stories, so anybody who's listening, there may be some people listening out there, they could say habu. Can you say habu? Yeah. Habu means that I'm listening and it says, tell a story, keep going. And I, I haven't fallen asleep yet. <laughs> because we have epic stories, you know, epic stories of three days. There's sometimes seven days and you really, uh, you get cramps in your face from laughing so hard. My, my cousin does epic stories, you know, so they're so fun. They're a blast, but um, it's a shorter story, you know. Won't need her sleeping bags for this one. So, <laughs> so uh, make sure you say habu and there's a pause and that's a minimal aspect of the story because we say that we all tell a story and, and we all help. So, long ago, lay a tool away, way over there. Whale was there. Whale was there. And oh, it was a hot summer day. Oh, it's quite cold. Oh, it's shining down so hot. Ah, but Whale found himself high up on the beach and it was dry. Oh, it was so hot. And Whale knew he could not live long on that hot, dry sand. So he called out to his relatives for help. And this is kind of what he sounded like when he called for help. Help. <laughs> So there, good thing a relative heard, uh, was cousin Flounder, and Flounder was only about this big. Flounder came up, got on his whale, uh, got his tail fin down there as good as he could, and bent down, stretched his back a little, and pushed as hard as he could. <gasps> and whale's blubber just jiggled. <laughs> Wasn't good enough. And so there, they both cried out to the water, to the relatives for help. Hey, wait a minute. You guys can help call for help, can't you? You're not going to let whale call for help and, you know, flounder call for help by themselves, are you? Yeah. So you guys can talk whale. This is where we get to learn other languages. <laughs> and so we can call for help out to our relatives. Here we go. Speak whale now. <laughs> Very good whale speaking. That was great. Bilingual people, I love it. And so there, oh, the next one heard. It was cousin Soulfish. And Soul was just a little bigger than Flounder. He came up and got underneath the whale. Oh, he had to stretch his back a little, though. He had to do a little bit of soul yoga. And so you can all stretch your backs a little. And bend his back down and put his fins up. And there he pushed, they both pushed as hard as they could. You gonna help push? You guys gonna help push? These are your fins. We all are members of the Salish Sea here. So these are our fins. Okay, we push hard. <gasps> and whale went up one inch only. It wasn't good enough. Maybe somebody in the back wasn't really pushing. We don't know. <laughs> Habu. So there they all three cried out to the water for help. Here we go. And there the next.
next one heard. Oh, it was Cousin Halibut. And Halibut was really, really big. He was huge. Oh, he was almost as big as a slalacub. Anyone know what a slalacub is? It's a sea monster. What a lot of people don't know is in the Salish Sea where we live, we have mermaids, leprechauns, sea monsters, and uh, we got Sasquatch, of course, and then we have uh, basket algers, is a uh, women monsters, really big, 10 feet tall, love to eat children that don't listen to their parents and grandparents. <laughs> so that's where we live. Better get used to it. <laughs> and that's uh, much like the Isles, you know. So there, there, good thin. Oh, yes. Yes, there, they heard, and there halibut came. And halibut got underneath the whale, right next to flounder and sole. And they all three stretched their backs. Oh, it felt good. They did a little bit of halibut yoga now. <laughs> oh, and they bent down and they pushed as hard as they could. <gasps> oh, and the whale went up. Woohoo! Oh, they couldn't believe it. Whale was off the sand and rocks. But all of a sudden, <laughs> whale came down and landed on all three of them. Habu. Turned out, you know, those rocks and things had a little bit of green stuff on them, like algaes and some seaweeds, and there all of their fins slipped out, and there whale landed on flounder, sole, and halibut. And that's why even today they're all flat like this. They got flattened out, like that, and their eyeballs got moved to the side of their face way over here from the day that they lifted up whale but maybe they could have been a little bit more careful. And that's all. <laughs> yeah. And so I tell people, I tell, when I tell it to children, I say, hey, because these are our teachings. This is a swim. This is our knowing and understanding. This can help us become a better person. We know that. We've proven that. We created paradise. We know this is true. We co-created that. So I ask them, what in the story could you become a better person with? Can you tell me? What one thing in this story could help you create a, a world that is better for everyone, every being? I ask them, so I'll ask you, do you have any feelings? I mean, the first, you know, feeling I have is a song. Mm. It's, it's to sing to yeah. the whales and sing to the yeah. flout, sing to the halibuts, yeah. to sing to them. Yeah, that's, I was right, that's that song. That, that whale, when the whale was speaking, that's very good because whale wasn't just talking, they sing too. So it's a universal language, right? Yeah, so maybe they were speaking three languages. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, any other things that we can think of? How about, uh, yes? Saying thank you. Saying thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they did, they picked up that circle of life and that's our gratitude. Mm -hmm. When they pushed up their fins, those are their hands. Even the cedar tree has hands. Mm -hmm. And they, they lifted up the circle of life and they gave thanks too. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Any other things about, how about working together? Mm -hmm. How about any thoughts about that? Or just the love that they shared to come to the rescue. Yeah. And they just wanted to be there. Yeah. Even if they couldn't just raise an inch. Yeah. They still tried. Right? And so, it only took one, right? Mm -hmm. Only one heard. Mm -hmm. Did one say no? It's worthless. Mm -hmm. There's no chance of me ever lifting. Look how big you are. Why should I even come? No, they didn't do that. Just like Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. She didn't give up because other children didn't show up. She kept showing up. Others showed up. 10,000 children in Germany and Europe marching through the streets saying, give us a future. Fridays for future. It's awesome, you know. So, yes, that's so great. And uh, so what about, um, who, who did they uh, call out to the water to? Who did whale call out to originally? The first fish, yeah. Um, salmon. Yeah, relative, right? That was relative, isn't it? Yeah, so, so what do we do with the relatives? Yeah. yeah. 
What else do we do? We help them. We're hel yeah. helper relatives, yeah. Yeah. Lift yeah. them up. Yeah, lift them up. And who's our relatives? Right? All our relations. Yeah. Everybody you go right to the point. Mm -hmm. I like you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of times the children say, oh, my mom, my dad, my uncle, my grandpa. Yeah, so that's right. And you help them, right? Yeah, that's great. But I say, well, outside that, well, oh, yeah, what about those trees? Oh, yeah, what about that water? Those are all our relatives. So what do we do with them? We help them. And, and in this story, what do we do with them? We lift them up. We lift them up above ourselves. That's our old teaching. When we give gratitude, say, Hayas Kasiyam. Hayas Kasiyam. And we learn this from the cedar tree. And this is uh, an upward lifting motion as if the boughs are moving uh, from the wind. And, and it's said to be an upward lifting motion because we are also taught in this teaching that we are here to lift everyone up above us. But the most important thing is not me, myself, and I, but it is the fact that the people around me are lifted up there well, that my family is well around me. And if my family is outside of the human family, and it's in the trees, it's in the water, it's in the salmon, it's in, in the air that we breathe, and it's in the mycelium in the forest, and it's in all of those beautiful things, and the birds, and, and the rivers, and the Salish Sea, and the ocean, well, now we've taken care of them. Now we've lifted them up. Now everything is whole and well because, because we, we know our place now. We know who we are, who we are as a human being, who we are intended to be because our teaching is that we were put here last, the human families. We were put here last and all the other beings were put here before us and that we were put here to lift them up, to be their voice, to help them, to have a promise for them, to make sure that every family is respected and will continue until the end of time. And so I believe that as we learn what it means to be a human being once again, what are responsibilities of a true human being. What are they? And that lies in indigenous wisdom and knowledge that we can apply that to the wonderful things that are happening in this world to do with solutions, solutions on how to live beyond all of these things that we work with, such as pipelines that are in the destruction of water and climate chaos and climate system collapse, all of these things. Well, we need bridges right now. We need solutions. We need direct action. We need well thought out and organized direct action today, right at this moment. If you listen to some of the youth speaking, they'll say the same thing. That's exactly what we need today. So we come together as one family, one human family today as one voice for all the beings, one voice saying, we bring the future for you, children. We bring the future for you, trees, ancient forest, natural animal. I want the salmon to have a home again. I don't want our salmon to be homeless no more because that's where we, we live now, with salmon that don't have a home. And so that's why you don't see the bears. That's why you don't see the eagles very much. That's why you don't see the salmon jumping in the water and filling the rivers anymore. Yeah, because we need to, to have that you know, promise to them again and, and then they can return and then, then we can have that place in the circle of life again. We can say, yeah, I'm part of this now. I can see it right in front of me. I don't have to look in a book to read about it. I don't have to listen to a, a story about those times. I want our people to have everybody to have that opportunity to have all of the wellness right touching their skin right against them. And, uh, and then we really got something. And I'm a believer that even in today's world where everything has changed, the world of our indigenous people has, has gone away. And that's the truth. 
and uh, you know the Mayan prophecy, year two thousand. It, people scoffed and laughed at us. Oh, look, the world didn't come to an end. Well, try being indigenous. Mm. Try living in a world where everything was alive and respected and well and abundant. The sea was boiling with food. The rivers were packed with salmon. Respect was everywhere. Greed was illegal. Literally. And you tell me that that world did not die. And it's holding on. There's a spark. There's, there's embers of, of that world and those, those knowings of how to create that world once again. But it's up to us to decide that this is something that we need. And the way that we can get there is by having perspective. When we have perspective, now we can see what's missing. Now we can see what we need, where we need to go to. I want to go to a place where we have ancient forests, Salmon filling the rivers again. There's no reason why we can't have that today. There's no reason let Weyerhaeuser continue to cut those forests and our government and corporations. No. We just say, no, we're not going to do that like a, a poorer country somewhere else in the world anymore. Even they don't do that no more. And we can decide, hey, those salmon need a home, so those are going to be ancient forests again. We're going to put mycelium in those forests. We're going to let them grow. We're going to leave them alone. We're going to get our, our you know, GDP somewhere else. Yeah. How about gross national wellness? That's what we need. Yeah. We should be thinking about that, hey? <laughs> that's, that's my feeling. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hashka. Thank you for everything you do. Yeah. And also just to, you know, I know we're a little over, but just want to just say, you know, thank you to your ancestors too and all of our ancestors here and just the ancestors of this land. I just want to acknowledge all the ancestors here too. Ashka. Yeah, definitely give them gratitude and I thank you for doing that because we should know whose bones we walk on. We should know and we should pay respect to them. We should. I believe that we should also have a feeling in our heart to be in harmony with them, to learn something about that and then apply that to our life. So I wouldn't want to go upon someone else's land and not live in harmony with their ways because that's called colonization. And I would, we never colonized anyone. Even a house next door would have their own teachings. We wouldn't push them on even another longhouse. So I really believe in that, that being in harmony, yeah, with the, the ancestors under our feet. So I thank you for that. Haishka, CM. CM, Haishka, CM. Thank you, Honorable One. Thank you, Honorable One, Haishka, CM. Thank you. Happy